In this video lesson, we are going to discuss confounders. What confounders are, how they arise, and how we can prevent them when we design our own studies and experiments. So in the news this week, you might have heard that a big Australian study just broke out saying that people who take aspirin on a regular weekly basis are three times more likely to experience blindness in old age than people who do not take aspirin. And the exact numbers are up here. That this, uh, this study saw that people who take aspirin once a week or more have a 9.3 blindness rate compared to people who did not take aspirin who had a 3.7 blindness rate in old age. And this was a 15 year long study with 2,000 people. So this was a very interesting study that came out with these surprising results. So the news broke, the media went wild, and these scientists proclaimed Aspirin causes blindness. So they came out with this daring statement that aspirin leads to blindness. Now let's first talk about causal link. Causal link, the root of that is cause, causation. That there's something about the aspirin that is causing the blindness. And a causal link explains the mechanism, the path at which this occurs. So, let's think, what could be a causal link in a scenario like this? A causal link would have to be something about the aspirin, right, that leads to blindness. So causal link, maybe the scientists in the lab discovered that there's some kind of compound in the aspirin that leads to optic damage after long-term use. So this would be some kind of compound, some kind of ingredient in the aspirin that leads to blindness. So I'm going to just say some kind of compound, compound X. And in the study, in this particular study, they weren't able to come up with a causal link. Usually they do, they come up with some kind of um, mechanism through which the aspirin does it. This was just such a surprising study that these scientists just uh, immediately alerted the news without digging too much deeper into how the aspirin causes blindness. So the key thing to know about a causal link is it answers that important question of how, how the aspirin causes blindness, the mechanism. So that's a causal link. Now, let's talk about confounders now. A confounder is this lurking variable, this hidden variable that is hiding behind the aspirin, pinning the guilt on aspirin, making it look like aspirin is causing the blindness. But actually, aspirin isn't the culprit, that this other hidden variable is responsible for the blindness. And the aspirin is only associated with this other variable. So the way I would map this out is this culprit, this missing, this mystery variable that also makes people more likely to use aspirin as well as a link to blindness. And when you read that chart, you can see, look at how closely aspirin and blindness are related right here. You can see how if we saw that blindness rates were so much higher in aspirin users, we could easily come to this conclusion. And that's what these scientists did. They see high rates of blindness in people who take aspirin. So they immediately come to this conclusion. Well, a causal link is some other variable that's lurking out there, hiding behind aspirin, making it look like aspirin is responsible for the blindness. Now remember, this was an observational study, so this was not randomized. These people were not prescribed aspirin by doctors, while half were not prescribed. This was completely self-selected. So they just observed people who are doing their natural daily regimen, some people taking aspirin, some people not, and observing the, the long-term rates of blindness. So because this is observational, there are going to be inherent differences between the two groups, aspirin users, aspirin non-users. What would we care, what are some qualities that we can expect from people who take aspirin regularly? Anybody have any ideas? What would, what would be something, the characteristics that we would expect from people who are regular aspirin users? Any ideas? David? They're in pain. Yeah, these are people, aspirin users, might already be suffering some kind of pain. Why do people take aspirin to begin with? A headache, muscle soreness. These are people who are already suffering some kind of pre-existing condition, maybe. Any other ideas? Let's throw headaches up there, too, specifically. That one's kind of interesting. 
Headaches. People who have a lot of headaches take aspirin. People who already have headaches, hmm, you can see the dots are starting to connect. Headaches might be linked to blindness as well. Let's throw some other ideas out there. I might, does anybody's parent take baby aspirin? My dad takes baby aspirin once a week. Anybody know why? Ba yeah, yeah. Family history. Yes, thank you. Family history of blood clots. Blood clots that form in the system can lead to strokes, they can lead to heart attacks, it's really scary. And if you have a parent or a grandparent, aunt or uncle, who, um, who had a heart attack or had a stroke, one thing that doctors recommend is take a baby aspirin. Not enough to do any damage, maybe, but enough to keep your blood thin to prevent clots. So these are people who maybe have a family history with cardiac problems cardiovascular problems. Now let's talk about people who don't take aspirin. How will we characterize people who don't take an aspirin weekly? How many of you guys don't take aspirin weekly? A lot of you. What do you guys have in common that you might not have in common with my dad who does take aspirin weekly? What, what, what are some aspirin uh, non-user characteristics? No pain. No pain. These are people who are not experiencing pain. They don't have headaches. Let's throw that one up there. No headaches. No family history. No family history. No family history of cardiovascular problems. These are people who, you know, they don't think about the word stroke or heart attack on a weekly basis. These are people who don't have sad family histories with these problems. Generally people who are healthy. Generally people who don't have any concern for their health and have no reason to be concerned. So, let's come down to one big, these are all, let's come up down to a baseline. I would categorize people who are aspirin users as a high risk pool. These are high risk patients. So people who have headaches might already have some um, you know, problems with their head, with their uh, vision. People who have a family history with cardiovascular problems. So this, this is a higher risk pool. Well, people who don't take aspirin, I would consider lower risk to begin with. They don't have pain, they don't have ailments, they don't have a pre-existing condition, there's no family history. So, because these two groups of people are inherently different, can we necessarily compare them directly? If we see that this, this rate that we see, 9.3% blindness rate and 3.7% blindness rate, can we directly pin that on aspirin? Sure, one difference between these two groups is that one took aspirin and one does not. But what else is different? All of these other things. Look at these other differences. Just because we see a difference in their blindness rate doesn't mean we can necessarily pin that directly on aspirin. We could be pinning it on any of these other variables that they differ in. Do you see how this blindness rate could be the result of any of these other categories that we just listed. We don't know for sure if this could be, um, we don't know for sure if this could be directly the, the cause of aspirin. So any of these variables down here could be a confounder that we could put in this mystery box. Say for instance, people who have headaches, people who come home after a long day and they've got a terrible headache and the first thing they do is they take an aspirin. These are people who, headaches, make you more likely to take an aspirin. Also, we find that people who have headaches that are related to their vision might also have a higher rate of blindness as well, that these eye problems cause them to take aspirin, and these eye problems might later cause blindness. Now, one trap that students fall into is that they, could, they throw things in the mystery box that don't belong, like uh, sun exposure. A lot of sun exposure to your eyes is terrible and can cause blindness later in life. Should we put that in our mystery box? Sun exposure leads to blindness. Sure, any, any eye doctor will tell you, wear sunglasses. But what does sun exposure have to do with aspirin? Nothing. So that's an example of something that wouldn't be a confounder. Sun exposure leads to blindness. Check. Yeah, that, that link makes sense. That one checks out. Sun exposure leading to Aspirin? That one just doesn't fit. We would say, no, that one couldn't go there. 
So don't get too overly zealous about throwing anything with blindness in that box. In order for something to be a confounder, it has to both be related to the treatment, if you will. So this is kind of our treatment. And it also has to be related to the response that we study. So you can see why we drew those arrows here, kind of to our treatment and to our response. So that's what we throw in the confounder box. So because these two groups are inherently different in a million other ways, we can't directly pin this on aspirin. Any of their other differences that relate both to aspirin and to blindness could be put in this mystery box as this mystery culprit, making it look like aspirin is guilty. Aspirin is guilty by association. Any of these, you know, people who take pain, uh, medicine for pain, medicine for headaches, medicine for family history, those are things that go along with aspirin, that aspirin's trying to help. Aspirin goes along with headaches, it goes along, it's hanging out with a bad crowd. Aspirin is running with a gang of, you know, sick symptoms. So aspirin appears to be guilty by association. But maybe aspirin is helping. Maybe aspirin is actually reducing the rate of blindness, even just slightly. Maybe if these people were not taking aspirin, this rate might be 15% or 20%. But aspirin's limiting a little. You see how this study can get a little bit confusing just because it was an observational study that wasn't well controlled for? So let's talk about what we could do to prevent confounders in this situation. Does anybody have any ideas? What we could do? Oh, what other studies have we talked about? Should, was that, first of all, this was an observational study. Is that the best route to take if we want to avoid confounders? No, you're right. So the way, let's, let's talk about designing our own study, our counter study that says, hey, Australia, take a look at this. You're pinning, you're pinning this on, on um, aspirin a little too soon. So let's design our own experiment really fast. If I can get this board to erase. So let's just talk while I'm doing this. What could we do that could control for any of these confounders? How can we control for confounders? What other studies have we talked about? Not observational studies. We've talked about controlled experiments, randomized experiments. Maybe that's the path that we should take, huh? So, let's start out the same way that these Australians did. We have 2,000 participants in our study. So we have all of these adults in our study. 2,000 adults. Now, what Australia did is it said, aspirin users, go over there. Aspirin non-users, go over there. And then we'll compare the rates. So my dad would go to the right, selecting to take aspirin regularly. And I would go to the left, not taking aspirin regularly. What, what, would we, what could we do in a randomized experiment? Any ideas? We would assign aspirin use. So we would say, OK, we randomly assign aspirin use to you, 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 and you. We put every adult's name in the box. We stir it up really good, and we pull out the names. And we say, OK, you're an aspirin user. You're an aspirin user. You're an aspirin user. And half the, half the people in the box we assign to aspirin use. And then the other people who are left in the box, they're assigned to no aspirin use. So now who is left, who are in these groups now? In our aspirin use group, we've got people of all different ages, people with all different kinds of family history, people with all different kinds of medical conditions, healthy, sick, young, old. We've got everybody in there, a nice random assortment. Now, in the no aspirin use category, we also have that, healthy, sick, young, old, you name it, a nice random assortment of people. So that these groups are basically equal. And that the only thing that they differ in is aspirin use. Now if we saw a rate that was like 9.3% blindness here and 3.7% blindness here, now we could pin it on aspirin. Because the only thing that they differ in is aspirin use. That's how you avoid confounders. You, you randomly assign groups 
so that the two groups are our treatment group and our comparison group or control. Our two groups are as identical as possible. Then we compare the rate. And because the only thing that they differ on is whether or not they were assigned the treatment, then we can directly pinpoint and we could come to a conclusion like this. So I hope that this little lesson has been helpful. I hope everybody's feeling a little bit better about confounders, what a confounder is, what a causal link is as well. We touched on that. And how to avoid confounders. That's very important. So as you go forward and you're looking at studies, I would have you try and come up with characteristics that would describe people in the treatment group and describe people in the control group and see if there's any other differences other than the treatment that we could pin as our lurking mystery variable. As a follow-up to that video lesson, I'd like to provide you with two examples to think about to try to test your own comprehension. Now that we've gone through one example extensively together, here are two for you to try on your own and see if you're able to make these connections. The first example is a study that you are already familiar with from your homework. The study that shows that children who eat a lot of candy as, as in, in childhood grow up and have a higher rate of criminal behavior as adults. Now, the causal link in this scenario would explain how candy leads to criminal behavior. What mechanism is it that candy follows leading to the criminal behavior? Things like this, you're probably going to want to think, um, you know, the medical route, maybe. The ingredients of candy things like that, how they could alter brain behavior and lead to criminality. That's a causal link explaining how, how the candy does this. The confounder is this lurking variable that we are not considering here that makes you more likely to eat candy to begin with and also more likely to be, have criminal tendencies in adulthood. So when we're trying to figure out what could be a possible confounder, we want to think about the differences between candy eating children and non-candy eating children. Because remember, this was an observational study. These children were just eating candy in their regular tendencies, and then later in life we were observing their criminal behavior. It wasn't that we were prescribing random dose, uh, prescribing candy dosages to different children. This was not a random study. So, what's the difference between a household that eats a lot of candy and a household that doesn't eat a lot of candy? Make a list for yourself even use anecdotal evidence from your own life and try and ca uh, characterize candy eating children and non candy eating children. Could any of those differences go in this mystery box and explain uh, what makes them more likely to eat candy and also what makes them more likely to later become criminals? So think about that one. The second example, I don't think we've gone over yet. It is a study, it's another observational study that saw a surprising rate of heart problems in people who were early risers, people who were waking up very, very early. And again, this was an observational study, so no sleep regimen was prescribed. This was an observational study. We were just looking at the rate of heart problems among people who wake up early and people who tend to sleep in later. So a causal link, again, would explain this mechanism of how, how waking up early leads to these heart problems. What it is medically, what kind of process mechanism goes on in your body when you wake up early that leads to these heart problems? How does waking up early cause a heart problem? That's causal link. Confounder, again, is this, this other variable that we're not considering here. Something that would make you more likely to wake up early to begin with, and also more likely to have heart problems as well. So what we want to do is try and characterize early risers, people who wake up at 4.30 in the morning. What are their daily lives like? What are qualities that we see in those people? And now think about people who wake up a little later, 8 a.m., 9 a.m., 10 a.m. How are those people different than those early risers? See if you can figure out differences in those two populations. Find a quality that could fit in here and explain why these people are waking up early, why they have a tendency to wake up early, and also explain why that population also has a tendency to have a higher rate of heart problems. So with this in mind, I think that you guys should be set to complete your homework and prepare for exam one and have a good solid foundation of confounders.